Welcome, teacher friend. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two literacy educators in Baltimore. We want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. Our district recently adopted a new literacy curriculum, which meant a lot of change for everyone. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning about literacy with you today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy Literacy Podcast. We are very excited to be here today with Dr. Nell Duke. She's a professor at the University of Michigan. Um, we are, have been big fans of Nell Duke since, um, well, since I worked at City Schools, Melissa. I remember having um, Nell come in and she did a little small group presentation and I was thrilled to hear everything that she had to say and, and all of the research that she shared. So Melissa, I know you're really excited to talk with her too. Yeah. Nell Duke is a big deal in Baltimore because she came to talk to us so much. So we are very yes. excited um, to talk to her about some of her, her new articles that she has. So yeah. yeah. Welcome. Nell. Wait. Well, Welcome. thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So um, we'd love for you to just start by sharing just a bit about yourself. Um, I know that you have a wonderful, wonderful website, nellkduke.org. So we can send everybody there if they'd like to learn more. But um, if you could just give us like a brief little bio and um, we'd love to hear that from you so we can frame it for our listeners. Who are you and um, what are we going to talk about today? All right. Well, I'm a professor, as you said, at the University of Michigan. I'm in two programs. One's called Literacy, Language and Culture, and the other is the Combined Program in Education and Psychology. I study early literacy development, uh, birth to age eight. I can stretch to the end of elementary school, um, <laughs> but uh, really do focus primarily on our youngest learners and how we lay a foundation for literacy success throughout their lifetimes. A lot of my work has focused on informational text and how we um, lay a foundation for that for young children. I also work a lot on reading comprehension development in young children and on issues of equity in literacy education. Um, in recent years, I've um, been writing about really all aspects of um, literacy education, just um, <laughs> mainly because if, if we can't get the foundational skills right, then there's not going to be much room to do comprehension and informational text in the areas that I've done research on. And so I've been um, doing a lot more work trying to really get, um, you know, share more information about how to do research aligned foundational skills instruction. And I've also been doing a lot of work on project based learning in the last many years. Excellent. Basically, no big deal, right? Just, just <laughs> your everyday just run-of-the-mill literacy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I always tried to get Nell to come to Baltimore to talk to our secondary literacy teachers. And she's like, that is not my thing. Don't. <laughs> I'm not talking to them. <laughs> but she gave me great people to talk to. <laughs> that is funny. Oh my gosh. Well, we're excited to talk with you today, Nell, because... Um, You've written a couple pieces lately that we want to draw some attention to, and hopefully after this conversation with you, shift our language uh, to be more intentional. I know we always reference Scarborough's Rope, um, and Melissa and I reference that often in our podcast and in, in our literacy lives, um, but I would I think after reading your pieces, it's um, important to be really intentional with our language, and now that we know more, we're going to do better and use different language to uh, address the Scarborough's rope, if you will, that you've, I guess, updated, revised, added to, edited. So we'd love to hear a little bit about the research that you've done and um, your pieces that uh, that we're going to talk about today. So do you want to frame the uh, a little bit about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Thanks. Um, so um, I co-authored the piece that you're referring to, um, and I'll read the exact title uh, for your listeners here. <laughs> um, it's The Science of Reading Progresses, Communicating Advances Beyond the Simple View of Reading. And it appeared in Reading Research Quarterly in May, and um, it is freely available online. Um, it's not behind a paywall, I'm glad to say. Um, nice. So, um, so in that article, what Kelly Cartwright and I um, tried to do is to um, both acknowledge, you know, the, the real significance of the simple view of reading, um, which probably many of your listeners uh, have heard of. But just briefly, um, this is a model of reading that was put forth in 1985 um, by uh, Goff and Tumner. 
And in that model, um, reading is is posited to be a product, and that's very important. So the time symbol here, product, <laughs> um, of two components, decoding and listening comprehension. And already some of your uh, listeners might be like, wait a minute, uh, I don't, I didn't think it was decoding and listening comprehension. In the original article in 1985, um, it, it really was actually uh, decoding and listening comprehension or a, a, a few times in the article, they used linguistic comprehension. It's much more recently um, that um, other researchers and writers have broadened those terms to word recognition and language comprehension. And that's actually a substantial improvement over the model right there. It captures a lot more data when we use those broader terms of word recognition and language comprehension. Anyway, so that's a simple view of reading. So that that was originated in 1985. And then as you've mentioned, there's um, Scarborough's rope model of reading that was put forth in 2001. And um, it's a model that I've drawn on a lot in my own work. I, I think I very much admire uh, that model. I think it has so much going for it. Um, but of course, it's been 20 years. And, you know, just as in medicine and public health, you know, we don't, uh, you know, have the same understandings now as we had 20 years ago, right? Our, our knowledge continues to advance. That, that's how science works. Um, same in literacy. So there's some things we know now that we didn't know um, in 2001 or in 1985 um, with the simple view of reading. And so what Kelly Cartwright and I did in this um, recent article was we just tried to update some things. Um, so point out some things that we know now that we didn't know then um, that seem important for teachers and for educators to understand. And that's really where our focus was, is what are some things that, are, that it's important you know, for the field to understand? We tried to pull that all together in a model we're calling the active view of reading. And there's a, a sort of colorful graphic in the article <laughs> that represents that model. But there are other, you know, updated models out there. You know, listeners, you know, may have a, another model that they prefer. Um, and we actually talk about a number of them and, and draw attention to a number of updated models of reading within the paper itself. So, you know, there are a lot of possibilities out there. I think our biggest message was we do need to move beyond um, models from 1985 because we just know more, you know, and when we know more, as you say, we do more. So, um, yeah. So I could talk about some of the key differences of the model. Would that be useful? Yeah, that would be great. I just, can I just really quickly, I love that you all are talking about, I think we often talk about science of reading as if it's this like static thing, right? Yeah. Like, like, does this align with the science of reading as if it's like, just like these five bullet points that are never going to change. Um, so I just love the idea of that, you know, when we talk about science, especially, gonna, it's going to continue to change, and we need to continue to be okay with it evolving. Um, so I'm just Melissa. Yeah. That is such a great point. I'm so glad that you you know took the time to point that out because I think you're absolutely right. A lot um, seems like a lot of people do think of science of reading as like a a static like body of settled knowledge, mm -hmm. um, and that. <laughs> Um, you know, there's certainly some things that we feel pretty confident about from the research yeah. at this point, but right. you know, we're always going to have, you know, um, evolving understandings. I, I think of it, if you, if you use the analogy of a vaccination, you know, the science of vaccination three years ago and the science of vaccination today are quite different because we have new techniques and we have, you know, new, new, um, understandings and new phenomena, um, new, new tech, uh, paces in which we can develop vaccines. I mean, there's just so many things that have changed. And, um, and so, you know, similarly in literacy, um, part of what it, it means for us to be professionals is that we embrace, um, not the swinging of a pendulum, you know, not bandwagons, not, you know, what the latest guru says. That's not what we embrace. But we embrace that research studies over time accumulate and typically converge on particular understandings. So thanks for making that point. Yeah. And I was going to say, it feels like you're, you all are building on what's already been kind of settled, if you want to use that word. But, yeah. you know, it's not like, let's throw all this stuff away because something new came out of the science. But it's okay, we have some things in place, but there are some new things that we can add in or change or shift the way we look at it. That's absolutely right. And I hope that the piece came through. We certainly intended to write it, you know, as very um, respectful of and, um, you know, just a, a next step in, um, you know, these yeah. important models that have come before. And in fact, you know, I hope that 20 years from now, people aren't 
using the active view of reading anymore. I hope that 20 <laughs> years from now, they have, you know, another more updated model that adds additional or, or adjusts additionally. So yeah. that's our hope. I think too, to add to that, it's, it's a lot of deepening what's already been done. So it's, it's for me, it called out some more specific pieces that can only help us moving forward versus, um, like you said, swinging the pendulum. Like this is definitely not that because there are core pieces that are staying, um, grounded within, but then there are pieces that are being fleshed out a little bit more. So I think we're excited to hear from you a little bit more about that. Some examples of those pieces that are being deepened, if you will. Sure. Um, great. So I, one really key piece is that in both the rope model and the simple view um, model, um, the uh, components of uh word recognition and language comprehension or in earlier form decoding and listening comprehension um, are, are depicted as largely separate. Um, in the rope model, they, they eventually uh, pull together, um, which is um, a really, I think, a very nice metaphor um, of that braiding of the rope. Um, uh -huh. But um, in actuality, what we know um, from research is that um, there are actually some knowledge and skills that bridge those two constructs. Um, that is, uh, the D and the LC aren't entirely separate, actually. Mm. There are these <laughs> things that are sort of the integration of the D and the LC in the simple view. Um, we call those bridging processes. And what we know about them is that they both affect and are affected by both language comprehension and by word recognition. So um, I can give you just a few examples of, of some of these. Um, so yeah. one is reading fluency, which I know, um, you know, your listeners are probably really familiar <laughs> with. So, you know, reading fluency is um, obviously very affected by your word recognition, um, but it's also affected by your language comprehension and affects your language comprehension. Um, uh -huh. So, so it it encompasses um, really both of those, um, particularly when you're looking at the more um, the sort of prosody or expression. You know, the, the aspects mm -hmm. of fluency that have to do um, most closely with um, representing language, if you will. Um, um, and so that's one, a really important one that, again, I know your listeners are, are very familiar with is vocabulary knowledge. So uh, traditionally, people think of vocabulary knowledge as, as just over in the language comprehension um, part of things. But what we know from research is that um, actually um, language, uh, vocabulary knowledge affects word recognition. So you're actually, um, if you have a higher uh, vocabulary knowledge, if you know the words that um, you're now attempting to decode, it improves your ability to decode them. Um, so that vocabulary really is, is a reflection of and affects both word recognition and language comprehension. Why does that matter? Well, um, if you have a student who is struggling with word recognition, one of the possibilities that has to be considered is that part or maybe even all, but probably part of that is a vocabulary issue for that child and not just an issue of, um, for example, um, graphophonemic knowledge or, you know, knowledge of the relationships between graphemes and phonemes and words. And if you don't realize that, you could be putting a kid through more and more and more and more and more phonics intervention when what they really also need is a heavy dose of vocabulary and concept knowledge intervention. So that's one of the reasons why, it, again, it's just practically helpful to think of vocabulary as that bridging skill. And I'm excited to say that this week, um, I read a, a new article out and I won't remember all the author's names, but I know Sharon Vaughn was one of them um, in with fourth and fifth graders in which they tested word reading instruction for kids who are, who are at risk for reading difficulty. Word reading instruction alone versus word reading instruction plus vocabulary and the word reading instruction plus vocabulary group grew more in their word reading. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's a great example of how, yeah. you know, really this is a thinking of this as a bridging skill and acknowledging and understanding the relationship of vocabulary to both word recognition and language comprehension can really um, help our, our learners. Um, so that's um, and a couple of examples, fluency and vocabulary of, of those um, bridging processes. Um, I'll just quickly mention the others. We put in the model um, print concepts. So, you know, understanding how language works, for example, that we read from left to right in English, um, that uh, has historically, you know, in the rope model is, is under language comprehension, but in fact, you've got to know that left to right directionality in order to read words, right? So it also affects <laughs> word recognition. Yeah. 
um, morphological awareness we put in there. That's awareness of those, um, you know, smallest meaningful chunks within words. Um, and uh, morphological awareness is another one that has been shown in many studies um, to be related to both word recognition and language comprehension and morphology intervention. So when you go in and you teach kids prefixes and suffixes and roots, that actually can improve both word reading and reading comprehension. So morphological knowledge has a, a place. And then the last one is a bit of a mouthful. So bear with me. <laughs> um, but the last one that we put in the active view of reading in the bridging processes section is graphophonological semantic cognitive flexibility. Which okay, I'm really okay. glad you broke it out into what it means. <laughs> Under, just underneath of it. <laughs> So it's uh, graphophonological semantic cognitive flexibility. So what does that mean? So graphophonological, um, you know, graphemes and phonemes or roughly speaking, not quite accurate, but letters and sounds. And then semantic meaning and then cognitive, you know, mental flexibility. So this is basically your brain's ability to essentially simultaneously consider both the uh, graphophonological structure of words you know, the, the sort of decoding aspects of words and to consider what those words mean mm -hmm. um, or to very, very actively and quickly switch um, between those. So you both do that very well, I'm sure. Um, so you're, you're just able to handle both of those at the same time um, in your minds. But we know that um, adults and children, both, uh, research has been done with both, um, who have difficulty with reading are often not as good at that. Um, it's harder for their brains to, you know, pay attention simultaneously to these two things. Um, and you can see how this is a bridging skill, right? It, you can, it's a direct example of a bridging um, between word recognition and language comprehension. And fortunately, there is um, now research, intervention research that shows that we can do some things that actually train brains to pay um, attention to both of those um, more together, you know, become more flexible and that that improves reading comprehension. So, um, so those are some of the bridging processes. That's one, you know, big piece of our model that I think is, is important for, um, uh, uh, teachers to understand. And then I think the other, you know, big piece is really just, we've added some things, some constructs to the model, um, that weren't there previously, um, that are important to reading. Um, one piece we've added is called theory of mind. Um, oh, yeah. I like and I didn't. You were, you know, we were right, talking about that right before we talked to you. Like, what? Remind me what theory of mind is. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, it it is a, a construct that's been around a long time. Um, in particularly uh, research on preschool uh, or you know very early childhood development, um, but more recently there's been more work on theory of mind and uh reading and um theory of mind is basically our ability to think about what someone else is thinking or what someone else is feeling mm -hmm. so kind of putting ourselves in someone else's perspective and um it's very important to narrative comprehension right in order to really understand a story you have to understand what the um characters in that story are thinking, feeling, like their motivations. Um, and so that's where theory of mind has implications for reading. Um, so that's one example of something we added to the model. Um, and then a, a bubble that, the whole bubble of our model, if you see it, you'll know what I mean by bubble, but- um, we'll, we'll link it, we'll link it. <laughs> yeah, it's active uh, self-regulation. Um, and so um, this is, is a cluster of things we put together that um, really fall under the broad umbrella of active reading and self-regulative reading. Um, so it's, first of all, motivation and engagement, you know, just- um, being motivated to read and then sustaining that motivation over time, uh, which some, some researchers call volition, um, and being engaged in that reading. Um, we know that, um, that interventions to improve motivation can actually improve reading, um, mm -hmm. to improve reading motivation can actually improve <laughs> reading. Um, the, the relationship, like lots of these constructs is complex because reading ability also affects motivation. 
right? Right, so, right. And, you know, mm-hmm. so it's it's kind of a, a, a two way, but um, yeah. the purpose of our model was to talk about things that influence reading rather than things that reading influences, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. um, so we focus on how motivation and engagement um, influence uh, reading. Um, we also included executive function. And again, this is one that that is an area where there's really been an explosion of, of research and, you know, still sorting out a lot of the technical issues, but, um, for the purposes of, of, of your listeners, um, you know, if you think about some of the children that, or students that you may have had over the years where, um, it seems like part of their challenge is sustaining their attention to what mm-hmm. they're reading, you know, keeping their mind from wandering. Yeah. It was um, called you know, it stamina. Kind of, stamina is what we Stamina, <laughs> yeah, stamina. And like, um, we, we talk about as inhibitory control. So like, mm. can you stop yourself from going off on a mental tangent? You know, and I think we yeah. can all relate that sometimes oh, yeah. we can't, right? <laughs> we we're reading along and, and, you know, we read about a character's, you know, is doing laundry and all of a sudden we're thinking about our own laundry and we're realizing we didn't totally. get it done last week, right? So the ability to sort of suppress those thoughts and yeah. stay focused on what you're reading is called inhibitory control. And for people who have difficulty with things like that, reading comprehension can be more difficult. Mm. And so that's an example of, of where that um, executive function piece um, has fallen in. And it is interesting to see that there are a growing number of interventions where, you know, usually researchers aren't intervening on just executive function, but when they combine intervention on executive function with intervention on other aspects of reading, that additional attention to executive function um, seems to be well, well worth it. Um, now, what would that, do you mind doing like a quick little tangential piece? What would that look like? Because I mean, I'm still sitting here thinking about the laundry that I need to put in the dryer. So. Oh, my my laundry's in the washer, and now I had to make a I'm note thinking, for myself. That's what I was thinking. What, I'm going to put it in my notebook right now to after this podcast change the laundry, so I can then I can forget about it in my head. I'm constantly making notes to myself. That's my strategy. But I'm curious as to what an actual strategy would be, other than putting it on a post-it and remembering. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. No. I, again, we. I think we all can relate, especially us very busy, you know, multitasking professionals <laughs> who have the job and the home and the kids and the, you know, we can relate. Um, yeah. So um, you're giving me a bit of an opening to talk about strategy instruction because um, some of the strategy instruction models, part of what they're um, doing is is helping really with some executive function kinds of issues. So um, a big part of it is um, teaching readers to do things in their minds that keep those minds actively focused on their reading. So mm-hmm. um, one that's gotten a lot of attention um, in the research over, uh, over a number of decades now, so this is a pretty longstanding area, is self-questioning. Mm-hmm. So asking yourself questions as you read. Why would the character do that? Or why would that be a waste product of this scientific, you know, phenomenon or, you know, so that self-questioning um, seems like it is um, one way that we keep readers more actively engaged in the reading and more focused on what they're reading. And indeed, research uh, suggests, um, including in, in meta-analysis, that just teaching self-questioning can actually support um, reading comprehension, even though that's just one strategy. Um, and some of the work in this area, why questions are especially important. So you might have noticed my examples, you know, had that why question feel, um, you know, getting at that why often uh, forces us to make inferences and kind of to elaborate our understandings within a text. So that's an example of where um, you can be uh, kind of simultaneously um, improving, you know, what we traditionally think of as as comprehension strategy use, but also that um, it can really support uh, executive uh, function. Um, Another uh, strategy that I want to talk about that that certainly has overlap, um, I think, with executive function is um, comprehension monitoring. Mm -hmm. And this is so important, right? Paying attention to whether what you're reading is making sense. Um, And let me be very clear that I'm not talking about using sense to guess at words. That's not not something we recommend, but using ongoing attention to whether something is making sense as a way to flag whether you may have misread a word 
or that your mind is wandering or, you know, any number of, of other um, problems in your reading, you know, maybe you misunderstood a vocabulary word, maybe you understood one meaning of it when the author intended a different meaning of it. Those yeah. are all um, things that we notice when we're engaged in comprehension monitoring and um, stronger, more accomplished reading it, readers tend to be very good at comprehension monitoring. So for example, if your mind wandered to the laundry, you would realize it after a bit, you know, and you, oh, you know, I, I need to go back and reread. I wasn't yeah. paying any attention for the last, yeah. you know, two paragraphs or or whatever the case may be. So that comprehension monitoring is is so important. Um, and we do know from research, there are a lot of individual differences in that area. So some children are um, seemingly natural comprehension monitors. They just mm -hmm. do pay attention to whether what they're reading makes sense and they do stop or slow down um, if it doesn't. There's some really interesting eye tracking research that Carol Connor and colleagues um, did where they showed, you know, that our stronger readers really do slow way down. Mm -hmm. Something is inconsistent or doesn't make sense. Um, I think that's such an important finding. And just to go on a quick tangent, it's one of the reasons why uh, sending students the message that reading faster is always better mm -hmm. is really problematic, right? Because <laughs> yeah. we know that those really strong readers are in fact slowing down more yeah. than less strong readers when they're hitting those rough patches, right? Yeah. I have to undo a lot of that in my little one because she thinks, and she's going into fourth grade, but she is not, she does not stop when it doesn't make sense or the word you know, she's saying the word that could be said two different ways. She's saying it the way that it's not intended in the text and then just keeps going. Um, and I, I find myself saying what you're saying in a very child-friendly way to her often, like good readers reread and think about if it makes sense. And if it, it doesn't, then we go back and reread. She's like, I just want to get it done. I'm like, that's not the point, you know? And um, then I do a lot of mo like modeling to be like, oh my gosh, this doesn't make sense here. And I'm thinking, is she even listening to me? You know, but it's that it's reaffirming to hear that that is, you know, the right thing to do. Um, and that it's important to do that because it, it's really hard to make sense of what you're reading if you're not going back and slowing down and reading. I would love to learn more about that eye tracking research. That's really intriguing. I'm going to try to find some of that after. <laughs> yeah. If you have any trouble, let me know. I'm happy to share. I do think that's, that is really intriguing. And what you're doing with your daughter is just so important. Um, and, and it's, it's important to her comprehension, which of course is the point of reading, mm -hmm. but it's also important to her word recognition development, because if she speeds through those words, having read them incorrectly, then what she's doing is, an, is she's orthographically mapping the wrong, the wrong word pronunciation onto that word. And we don't want that either. So that comprehension monitoring is one of our um, protections or guards against um, kids doing the wrong orthographic mapping um, in their, in their minds. So it's, it's really so important. Um, so just practically speaking, I mean, uh, you know, we teach comprehension monitoring um, the way that we teach so many things. You'll explicitly explain it and we model it. I'm, I'm sure that's, you know, what sounds like you were doing with your daughter, you know, explicitly explaining why this is so important. Uh, but there are also some little tricks. Uh, one thing is, you know, kids just putting a little check mark at the end of each line they understood and a question mm. mark if they didn't. And just, you know, kind of training, therefore, that they're like paying attention each line to, to whether what they've read is making sense to them um, instead of checking in about it, you know, every few pages or something. Yeah, um, that's so, a great yeah. idea. That's what I'm going to do when I go back and reread this this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that strategy. To the, uh, article. <laughs> yes. the, the big one, the heavy one that we're talking about, the science of reading progresses. I'm going to use your strategy. Thank you now. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much. I was definitely oh, self-monitoring yeah. when reading yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So anyway, so those are some of the key, you know, differences um, between our model and 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 those past models. Again, very much building on them, but just extending. And and as I said, you know, one hopes that that you know, 20 years from now, maybe even five years from now, maybe even right now, <laughs> researchers will say, hmm, I think you should add this, or I think this should be in this bubble, not this bubble, or, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, that is, again, how science works. We read lots of studies, you know, that's what I do Saturday night. 
sit down with the research <laughs> journals. It's a very wonderful life here I have. Um, and, um, you know, read research studies and, and synthesize, you know, thousands of studies in your mind to try mm-hmm. to kind of sort out and map out the field. Yeah. yeah. You're in good company. That's what, I mean, I was thinking about doing this um, at the pool this weekend <laughs> with a pina colada and using the strategies. And that's what she already oh, synthesized for you, I, Lori. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, well so. a few things here on that, Lori. Um, first of all, I, I think it's important for your listeners to know that I did apologize to you for the fact that you were thinking you needed to read this article at the pool this weekend. Um, we read it again. All, no, I, I mean, it, but this is such an important help. article. I, a pina colada <laughs> can help. But this is such an important article to, to read again and again and again that uh, you know, I am willing to read it with a pina colada in hand at the pool this weekend for you. Um, but, you know, I do want to talk a little bit about, this is incredible work now first, but I do want to shift a little bit to, you know, thinking about my daughter and what I just shared. She is, um, she just finished third grade and she's heading into fourth grade. And I know that that's a time where, um, educators might use phrases such as she's quote transitioning from learning to read to reading to learn. And, you know, after reading your piece and knowing everything that, um, you know, Melissa and I always talk about, um, how decoding and, uh, language comprehension go hand in hand, uh, straight up from birth to all the way through, adulthood, um, we'd like to talk a little bit about those phrases and the impact of them as yeah. well as, you know, just how, I don't know, Melissa, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say what, um, I had in my mind the whole time that Nell was talking was that I, I've said this like a million times on the podcast, but during my letters training, I had a teacher who said like, well, if this is just so key to becoming a good reader, why don't we just start with word recognition and spend all of our time there and make sure that every student has it down pat before we go on to anything else. And in my mind, I'm like, no, 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 there's so many other things that are so important. We can't, we can't just stay there for years. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so similarly, I had that in my mind of like, you know, we have to I love the idea of the bridging processes because it really shows that these things do go together, right? We can't separate them out like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, both of you are making, I think, such important points for your listeners to hear. Um, And um, just to kind of give some, some um, credence to what each of you said. Um, So starting with what you were saying, Lori, about this sort of traditional idea of first we learn, read to learn, sorry, First, I can't even say it. I disagree with it so much. Um, first, we learn to read. Then we read to learn. Um, that First of all, that um, idea comes from work in the 1960s um, in which Jean Chal, in particular, um, was describing what typically happens in children's reading development, not what should happen in children's reading development. And in fact, one of the things I really admire about Dr. Ch- the late Dr. Charles' work is that she was a very strong advocate for more opportunities for children to engage with informational text and learning through text in the earliest stages of reading. Mm-hmm. So it's not that she wanted it to be first learn to read, then read to learn. Yeah. She was just describing what was out there. She was actually advocating over, over many years. She was advocating for a different kind of model. So again, leads credence to your questioning of that, of that idea. And then um, Melissa, with, with your point, um, it's just, um, so the letters training, um, you know, the, the lead developer of that is Dr. Louisa Motes. And I know for a fact that Dr. Motes does not want people (laughs) focusing on just word recognition and nothing else for the first uh, few years of school. So, you know, again, uh, hopefully that leads credence to the idea that, that even the materials that maybe have led a few people to come to those conclusions, you know, the very originators of those materials didn't want those conclusions. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, exactly. We, we just simply, it just does not make any sense uh, and and is not I don't know any researchers actual researchers who advise focusing on nothing but um, word recognition in the early years of schooling. Um, right away, we need to be concerned about comprehension development as well as well as as development in other areas I've talked about, like um, you know, in executive function, for example, and that um, really 
even very young children can handle texts that are designed for them to learn. Uh, so informational texts, you know, being the kind of most obvious category. Um, I did some research um, and many others have done research in this area, um, but I'll just give you one example of a study um, in uh, that was published in 1995, I think. So let's pretend <laughs> I was 10 years old at the time. So when I was 10 years old in 1995 and published an article with Jane Kinney's in Early Childhood <laughs> Research Quarterly, <laughs> um, uh, the... The uh, what we did is uh, Jane Case is a teacher, so this is a teacher researcher practitioner uh, partnership. Um, we uh, she had kindergartners, and at the very beginning of the year, we asked the kindergartners uh, individually to pretend to read two texts. One was very clearly a story, and it was, it was clearly a, a fictional story. It was a Mercer Mayor story with monsters and so forth. Um, and we covered up the words. So if there were kindergartners who could read, you know, they, they wouldn't do so. They, it was to pretend to read it. Say what you think the book might say. And we also gave them an informational text um, that was designed to teach about firefighters and firefighting. And this text had real photographs and there was no storyline. I mean, it was very clearly an informational text. So we asked them to pretend to read these at the beginning of the year. And then after that, um, Jane Kays read aloud to the children um, as information books and storybooks for three months. So each day for read aloud, you know, she would make sure that she had a nice balance, like the common core state standards call for, but this was long before that, <laughs> um, a nice balance between informational and narrative text. And then after the three months, we asked each kid individually to once again, pretend to read uh, those two, same two books, um, again, with the, the words covered up. And what we found was that the children differentiated, they're pretending to read, they're saying what they think the book might say. Um, those differentiated a lot more after three months than they had at the beginning of the year. When they were reading the information book, it sounded much more like an information book now. And the storybook sounded like storybook. So there are all sorts of, I won't get into all the linguistic details, but for example, in information books, uh, verbs are often timeless. So you might say like firefighters fight fires. Right. And that's timeless, right? It could be at any moment. Whereas in a storybook, usually verbs are timed and usually in past tense. So it would be something like the monster left the door, you know? Um, so what we found was that after three months, children were more using more timeless verbs when they were pretending to read the information book and using more timed verbs when they were pretending to read the storybook. So they had already kind of picked up on this language difference between these two um, kinds of text. And what we argued was, if you can do that as a kindergartner after three months of some read alouds, clearly reading to learn is in your wheelhouse, right? Like clearly <laughs> yeah. you know, you're able to handle these information books um, yeah. first as a listener, but of, you know, of course, as you know, by first grade, they can also handle them as readers themselves. So that's part of why, you know, we disrupt uh, both of those notions that the two of you brought, brought up. And I know you both have long spoken against those as well, which I really appreciate. <laughs> yeah. It's frustrating to, like hear it still, but you know, I think it's such an opportunity to dig a little deeper and to hear the why. And when, whenever I do talk with a teacher, you know, informally who is still using that language, they don't actually usually mean it the way that it's said. They usually mean exactly what we are talking about. It's just because no teacher that I know is, is denying students the opportunity to yeah. access those texts, right? Like teachers are reading yeah. kids books and yeah. they want them to learn to love books. I think it's just like you said now that the phrase became like catchy, even though it wasn't what it was intended. It was what it was happening versus what should be. It's such an important point that you um, are making because I think you're right. The vast majority of teachers are very interested in developing comprehension, um, not just listening comprehension, but also reading comprehension in those early years of schooling and are interested in using informational texts as well as, as narrative texts. It's, sometimes it's more that like our language or our pronouncements or some of our policies mm -hmm. haven't kind of caught up um, yeah. with, I think you're right, where, where many, many teachers um, are. And I do want to give due credit as well to curricula. Uh, which have shifted so much. I mean, earlier in my career, you would be hard pressed 
in primary grade curricula to find informational text. They were overwhelmingly stories um, and storybooks. Um, and similarly, I think the Common Core really, you know, state standards, um, you know, and of, of course I know, you know, people have lots of opinions about them and they're certainly not perfect and they're certainly due for an update in any case. Um, but the Common Core did make a very strong, you know, pronouncement about the importance of informational text and uh, learning from reading that I think um, did help to move the field along. Yeah. Yeah. And just to add to that with what Melissa, you had said about the teacher in letters training, I'm sure that it, I mean, if that, if that newer teacher, um, if, you know, you really dug deep into like what she said and you said, Hey, does that mean that you wouldn't ever read them? You're the kids, a book aloud about firefighters or whatever it might be. I'm sure her answer would be, Oh no. Yeah, you're right. That doesn't make a lot of sense. (laughs) Like, you know, I mean, I think digging deep, I think it's just a catchphrase that feels really catchy and sounds great. But I think what we should shift it to, if I may, is, learning is reading, reading is learning. And instead of, you know, two, it should just say is, and it all is working together and collaboratively. So I'm going to throw that out there to the world. Maybe we can, (laughs) maybe we can shift the narrative. We've got uh, lots of listeners and lots of downloads. So take that with you, friends. (laughs) Very nice, Lori. We brought up this pendulum swing. And I think that we do that a lot in literacy, right? It's like, we, we want it to be like one thing or the other thing or this thing. And you know, it really, there's so much balance and so many things that go in, you know, that, that model of reading, the active, active view of reading model that you all created. There's so many things on there that we do have, we have to pay attention to all of them. Um, You know, I think sometimes people like, I I maybe it's a comfort thing, right? Like if I compartmentalize it a little, or like, let me just focus on one part first, (laughs) it might feel a little bit better, but I think we all know that they're, they're all important. I yeah. think you're absolutely right. And I think, uh, you know, I, I, I try to use, you know, public health metaphors sometimes here um, because I think there are ways in which, you know, literacy development is a public health uh, issue for us mm-hmm. and in this country. And, you know, when public health advocates and researchers, you know, are perfectly comfortable with the idea that we need good sleep, that we need a healthy diet, uh, that we need to lower our stress, that we need to exercise, that we need to be in homes that are free of various kinds of environmental toxins, whether that's air pollution, lead, you know, and I could go on. But when advocates are, you know, trying to uh, speak to the importance of one of those, say sleep, they typically don't denigrate all the others, you know? Um, And I think that's really the mentality that we need to adopt in our Mm -hmm. field. Um, There are a lot of things that are important and sure they're going to be figure ground uh, kinds of things. You know, I'll be the first person to say like, get word reading instruction right in first grade. <laughs> you know, we are in bad, big trouble if we don't get that right. So of course that's going to be heavy on our mind, but it doesn't mean that we speak against or completely marginalize all of these other areas and we look for those synergies, you know, wherever we um we can. Um I also just want to kind of back again to really the wisdom of teachers, you know, some of the more extreme pronouncements that I tend to hear, um, there was a professional development group that was actually doing some work in Michigan in which they said, don't read aloud to kids till third grade. Oh my goodness. You can, what? can you believe that? I, <laughs> Why? Of course, I got plenty of, you know, uh, communications from people, you know, <laughs> attending that. Like, can you believe what? It, and um, from teachers attending that, um, pushing back. I do think that, um, it, at least my experience is that some of those loudest voices that are, you know, just sort of myopically focusing on one aspect of reading, um, or, you know, are, are saying this is bad, this is good. You know, they're often not actual classroom teachers. I think mm-hmm. that classroom teachers, you know, very, very often do recognize um, yeah. because they have the reality of the kids in front of them every day and the kids are teaching them themselves. You know, this is, you know, sort of all of the different ways in which they can have strengths and weaknesses in their learning. So I think we all just have to band together and and we hear somebody say, you know, build knowledge, but don't teach strategies. Or they say, you know, um, teach decoding, but don't teach comprehension or, you know, develop 
narrative comprehension, but don't do informational comprehension or do informational comprehension, but don't do story comprehension or whatever people are out there doing, you know, we just have to bring that critical eye, you know, and kind of put ourselves in that public health uh, shoes, uh, put ourselves in the public health shoes. That does not sound right at all. <laughs> put, our, put ourselves in the shoes of someone in public health um, <laughs> to make sure that, you know, we're bringing that, uh, that critical eye and that uh, lens of complexity. Yeah. So speaking of this, like focusing in on one area, <laughs> um, I have your other article in mind that we read before we, we talked to you. And I loved just the title of it, honestly, because it's the science of, oh, I'm going to get it wrong. The science of reading comprehension instruction. Um, and I always talk about this to Lori, I think, especially because I was a secondary teacher. I'm like, you know, the science of reading oh, like so often gets talked about only in this word recognition part of it. And we, we both are like, there's science <laughs> that also talks about the comprehension part of, of it too. Um, but we, no one's not, no one not a lot of people are talking about that part. So I was really excited to see your article that kind of brings that um, a little bit more to light. So I'd love to hear about that other article as well. Oh, thanks so much. So um, that uh, second article you're talking about, the Science of Reading Comprehension and Instruction, um, was published in The Reading Teacher. It was um, absolutely written for practitioners. Um, and it's also freely available online, uh, open access. Um, so we hope people might check it out. Um, yep. I would well, like I'll to link that as well. Now. Might take, <laughs> pardon me? Oh, I said, I'll link that as well. I'll link both of your pieces. Oh, thanks so much. And, yeah. and, and you might not even need a pina colada for this one. I mean, no. that no. Is, you have to, <laughs> you'll have to decide what you think. You know, I don't want to give us too much credit, but um, yeah. And this was co-authored with um, Alessandra Ward and um, with P. David Pearson. And um, just to put it a little bit in historical context, um, David Pearson uh, and I, with with collaborators, um, have published a piece about every decade for practitioners where we try to pull together, you know, what we think research is, is suggesting about um, you know, uh, elementary uh, reading comprehension instruction, and and we were due due for a piece. So um, that's uh, really what what this particular um, piece is. And um, I hope you know, I hope it will be useful to people. Um, the first thing that that I should say about it uh, is, is as you pointed out, you know, we really want people to understand um, which every researcher I know understands. So I don't, I don't think this is a controversial statement at all um, that the science, Science of reading encompasses not just word reading, um, but yeah. there's lots of scientific research around um, other kinds of processes that are going on in one's mind as they read and lots of scientific research. Um, I call it the science of reading instruction, mm -hmm. you know, that gets at the instructional context and instructional moves that support um, reading development. So, yeah. Um, so thanks. I I'm, uh, appreciate that you both read the piece. Um, I guess I can just, uh, you know, summarize for the listeners that what we uh, did in the piece is um, we identified some findings from research that we think are pretty robust, you know, that, that there's a, quite a bit of agreement on um, mm -hmm. within um, from study to study and a fair amount of research on. So, for example, our first point is that teaching word reading and bridging skills supports reading comprehension. That's a very, I'd be hard pressed to find anyone who disagrees with that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, so that's an example um, of of a kind of finding that that we share in the piece. And then with each one, we do try to you know point to some sort of practical um, directions for instruction. Um, in the piece, we do have a, a graphic, um, as you both know, um, so your readers know. There's a graphic, the layered model of reading <laughs> comprehension instruction. Yep. Yeah. It looks like a layer cake, but reverse, like a reverse wedding cake, if you will. <laughs> ah, thank you. That is a very, yes, yeah. <laughs> that is a very good, um, with that um, ombre, for, for those yes. who are familiar it's with that ombre, yeah. that fading of color, right? Yeah. Um, and so part of what we were trying to do there is actually get at something that both of you have raised, um, it, it, this sort of either or idea that, that often doesn't serve our field very well. So, you know, instead of kind of a metaphor of, say, a balance scale where you maybe put like knowledge building on one end and, and comprehension instruction on the other, in the layered model, you know, we suggest that that comprehension instruction um, is layered inside of um, the engagement with 
texts to in part build knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these things don't happen in different parts of the day. These right. things are, you know, really, really embedded and integrated. So, um, if I could go back to your daughter for a minute, uh, Lori, mm-hmm. you know, we did talk about the importance of, you know, that comprehension monitoring as well as her read word reading, but a, a sort of another layer up from that is, you know, why is she reading? You know, if you're just reading to finish an assignment and you don't have much, you know, s- sort of interest in the the assignment that you're doing, you're going to be less likely to apply those good comprehension strategies, slow down when you need to, you know, worry about accuracy and so on, right? Yeah. But if you embed or layer uh, that reading experience inside a motivating context, you know, she's reading this because then she's going to give a presentation for preschoolers about some information she learned, or she's reading this um, because she's going to come to school with her peers who read other articles and they're going to jigsaw and share what one another learned, you know, for the purpose of a project they're working on, you know, that's where we start to see a context that makes it more likely that we will, um, you know, that we'll do things like monitor our comprehension carefully and and so on. And um, so in our layered model, um, readers uh, will see that we didn't just focus narrowly on literacy. We tried to kind of the top, the top of that inverted layer cake to use Lori's um, description <laughs> also deals with just general, you know, generally yeah. good classroom practice and context and um, deals with uh, literacy and reading motivation um, and so on. So that's what we were trying to do there with that graphic. Yeah. What stood out to me, I think, is that um, you really draw attention to embedding strategies with in the knowledge building constructs. It's not, like you said, like team strategy or team knowledge building. It, it really fits together. And Melissa, I'm wondering if it might be um, helpful for us to give an example. I know we always speak to wit and wisdom because that's what we know. Um, do you, do, do you want to give an, do you want to try to give an example, Melissa, within the content stages? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, and then this kind of was in my head when you were talking earlier, Nell, about the self-questioning and self-monitoring. And I was thinking like, you know, in, within wit and wisdom, there's a, the first content or the first stage is, is about um, noticing and wondering, right. Just like getting students to, to see what, what do you wonder about this text? What do you notice about this text? And to me, that's like starting to, we, we call it like, you know, replicating these habits, like habits that they can start to like use as they, get to other texts on their own. Um, you might have more, Lori. That's just where my head was. Um, yeah. But I, I love that about Wit and Wisdom is that it's like, it's almost so like inside of the knowledge building texts and the engagement of these texts that it's almost not noticeable, if that makes any sense, but it's there. And I love that because when I taught, I did it the I'm just gonna say I did it the wrong way, right? When I like, I had a self-questioning day and we're gonna learn how to question. (laughs) And here's this random text that I have here for us to practice questioning. Um, And then I'm gonna see if you can do it and check off the box that says, oh yes, Lori can ask questions, but now not so much. Let's try it again next time, right? And like, that didn't make any sense. (laughs) Um, So well, I, I mean, like and I may have been able to ask questions because I was super interested in what we were reading about, right? It might have been a topic, right? Something that was familiar to me, and Nell might have had no idea what the topic was. But <laughs> yeah, I think, like going back to your point, um, now a moment ago, that when we embed those habits of mind with and and teach strategies within knowledge building, that that helps students be curious learners. It helps them to ask questions as they read. It helps them to, you know, have a bigger purpose. Um, And also when we do it within knowledge building, what I think helps me frame it is that it's not like this jigsawed, like different topics. It's a really fluid um, topical alignment where students are learning about a topic to really become an expert on it and to to be able to know about that specific topic. So really the intrinsical motivation could be to know more about a specific topic and to investigate questions within that, which is highly motivating for students just as kids, you know, they're, they're curious in nature. So that's what I always think about. And then, you know, like Melissa said with the, it's embedded within, like it has that wonder is the first stage, but 
organizes the second and you're asking like, what is happening in this text and okay. reveal, and you're looking a little bit deeper to see what something reveals about the text, distilling what's the essential meaning and no, how does this build my knowledge? So students are able to, to pull specific pieces that are going to help build their understanding so that they eventually can know more about a topic and then apply that. And I mean, if that's not motivating, I don't, I don't know what is like, <laughs> you know, I, I want to become an expert on lots of the topics that, you know, a lot of the high quality curricula that, um, is out there addresses. <laughs> Cause yeah. I feel like we didn't get to do that when we were in school. And it is pretty amazing to, to feel like a historian or to feel like a scientist and to know that information. It's empowering. Yeah. And I do think like, I think when I was teaching, at least, I think like some of these things fell into different buckets. Like I'm going to teach vocabulary over here separately. I'm going to teach, you know, I'm going to do some motivation over here by having them do some like self-selected reading. I'm going to do, <laughs> um, you know, this, something else over here about the strategy is totally separate. Right. Yeah. Like it was, it was like, like you said, trying to do things separately instead of like, how do we actually bring it all together? Yeah. Now you mentioned a piece of in your, not, maybe not you, but your, you and your team in, um, the piece that we're talking about now, the science of reading comprehension instruction, Melissa, when you said, uh, self-selected reading, it made me think about the part at the, toward the, the end. Reading. Yeah. That, uh, talked about volume reading. Would you be able now just very quickly, I know we're almost, we're, we're over time, but to talk about that, um, I, lo I loved this. This is really, really important, I think. So would you be able to draw that out and just quickly talk about it before we close out? Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you think of anything that people um, try to get good at, you know, playing the violin, swimming, you know, whatever the case mm -hmm. may be, um, it's hard to deny that an important part of that is you have to do the thing a lot. You know, you got to oh, yeah. swim a lot to become a really good swimmer. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you you have to play the violin a lot to become a very good violinist. Um, and the same is true for reading. You know, our, our strongest readers need to spend a lot of time reading. The conundrum here that I think our field has really uh, struggled with for a long time now is how do you make that happen? So, you know, one model is, well, you take large chunks of the school day and you just have kids read. Well, when that gets tested in research against more instructionally oriented activities, it typically loses. That is, you know, just this kind of old model where the teacher you know, sits and reads something the teacher's interested in and the students all, you know, uh, sit and read something they're interested in. Um, you know, for example, often called deer time, you drop everything and read. <laughs> um, I call it drop everything and find Waldo <laughs> because, yeah. you know, so often the, the kids are, you know, doing something like reading Where's Waldo or, you know, something that, that probably isn't doing a lot, you know, to further <laughs> yeah. their, their, their reading ability with, with, with all due respect. I mean, those books are really fun, but in terms of, you know, um, some of the kinds of, of reading moves that we need uh, students to make. Anyway, so so if if giving over large swaths of the day to kids just sort of reading whatever they want and the teacher reading whatever they want, you know, if that doesn't work, what does work? You know, what's going to mm -hmm. create a situation in which um, students have um, adequate time to do this thing that you have to do a lot to get good at, right? Not to mention that it builds knowledge, you know, per the examples the two of you were were giving, you know, shortly ago. Um, so, so certainly one thing is looking at outside of school time. And there are um, definitely a number of studies, and, and I think we cite a review in the paper, if I remember correctly, on what happens when we um, make sure that students have access to books over summer and have, you know, some mechanisms that encourage them to really read those books over the summer. And uh, some of those approaches do work very well to improve reading achievement. So, you know, that outside of school reading is, is one way that we can do it. Um, another way we can do it is through um, partner or dyad reading at least some versions of dyad re, uh, partner dyad reading um, have been tested in research and shown to be effective. Um, so that reading with that partner where you have certain ways that you and the partner are supporting one another in the reading, that seems uh, mm -hmm. to be a, a promising mechanism. Um, you know, situations in which students are reading with a higher degree of teacher instructional support, whether that's that they're reading to immediately um, try out something that they were learning or uh, they're, you know, in, in their instruction, rereading a text that they had initially, initially encountered in instruction, rereading that multiple times, 
um, doing readers theater um, to improve fluency, um, where, you know, the teacher is there really guiding that reading development, connecting that reading to to the meaning of um, whatever the text is that they're doing readers theater. You know, those are some of the kinds of things, you know, that have that additional layer of scaffolding um, that's important. And then, of course, now with artificial intelligence and so forth, there are increasing uh, numbers of programs that are designed to where the computer is listening to children read and responding <laughs> in one way or another. So eventually, you know, we'll have, have that too. But I think so like, do you think here, Alexa will ever be able to give feedback? <laughs> yes, I do. I am not crazy. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm just <laughs> being funny, but there oh my are gosh. Company, I won't name specific companies because I'll get in trouble if I name some and not others, <laughs> but there are companies right now working on exactly uh, that, that oh, idea wow. um, and researchers uh, who've oh long goodness. been working on that idea. Um, uh, Jack Mastow at Carnegie Mellon, for example, has been working on that idea for many years. So yes, um, but <laughs> the the larger kind of context and issue yeah. here really is um, that, you know, we do need students to read a lot. That's not going to teach them to read. So let's be very clear as, as always, this is one piece of a larger pie of things that need to happen, but we do need students to read a lot. Um, we accomplish that partly by making sure that our motivational mechanisms are in place, that we're creating a really motivating context for students to read. And then um, we accomplish that best uh, outside of school through, you know, various kinds of book access um, programs with, with various enhancements inside of school. We accomplish it by having a, a heavier layer of collaboration and instructional scaffolding rather than a traditional, um, you know, si quote, silent reading um, model. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I, I, Melissa, were you a deer? Did you do deer in your classroom back in the yeah, day? I did. Let's yeah. not talk about it, Lori. I know. <laughs> I was like, I didn't think that sitting in the front of the classroom and like reading would help anybody else read. That doesn't make any sense, but it was. I thought what, I was doing the right thing. I though, know. You guys. We're going to do a no better, do better confessions. Again, just to wrap up, because I think it's the theme of our whole conversation, like that's science, right? Like, you know, 30 years ago, there were all sorts of things we did that we thought would help our health. And later we've learned they don't really help. Or there yeah. were things that, you know, I remember when I was growing up, I mean, you just didn't really, the kids didn't wear seatbelts. We're right. climbing all over no. the back seat. Right. You know what? We were, yeah. we, were, we, we, were we were watching uh full like the original full house the other night oh my gosh they're in a convertible crossing the golden gate bridge with the, <laughs> like someone's in kids in the front seat kids in the back seat no car seats like I don't even know if anybody had seat belts on I was like oh my gosh no, I would never you know but you're right it, it, if we if we went by those constructs we would not be very safe today so thank not goodness for science right that's, that's it right there Lori thank goodness for science no we would love to invite you well first we want to thank you for your time but Absolutely. we would love to invite you to share one final piece of advice with our listeners because we think everything that we've talked about today has been so valuable. But if you can funnel it down to just one final piece of advice that is going to be the last thing that they hear from you before you leave, we'd love to ask you for that. Ooh, that's a tough one, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I I would ask everybody, um, first of all, uh, we're coming off such a hard uh, year and a half. And mm -hmm. so just on the affective side, I just have to say, let's give ourselves some grace. Let's give our children and our students some grace. Let's give our colleagues some grace um, going into this year, um, you know, get back to the things that are most important for, you know, our growth and for our children's growth. So I feel like I need to, to say that, but um, on the, the sort of um, side that's more in the technical aspects of things, I would just say that there are a lot of people out there right now talking about the science of reading who do not know what scientific research on reading actually finds, whose understandings are outdated, or outright wrong, who don't actually read research studies, who don't, uh, or read just a few, you know, cherry picked research studies and don't look at the whole volume of literature. Um, and I, I just would ask, you know, all of your listeners to really be critical consumers of people's pronouncements about science and make sure, you know, that 
you can really trust that who you're reading and hearing from has actually read lots and lots and lots of scientific research or is working with people who have read lots and lots of scientific research and that, you know, they are really uh, accurately representing the science, you know, just as I would hope your listeners would feel that way about any given public health issue, you know, Mm -hmm. that they should bring that same critical lens that hopefully they're bringing, you know, to issues of public health, um, to, to issues around, um, you know, uh, science and reading. And so I guess I'd leave it at that. And thanks so much for having That's me. It was really uh, such a pleasure to talk with the two of you. And I really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. That, I learned so much. I know it was amazing. <laughs> Actually, what you just said now reminds me of, we talked with James Murphy, who um, edited the research ed guide to literacy. And he had this concept of truth versus truthy and how teachers need to be aware of what is truthful versus truthy. And I was like, I love that so much. So I'm (laughs) going to throw back to an episode that we've just published and hopefully our listeners can uh, get a little more from that one after hearing your (laughs) plug to be (laughs) knowing what is truth versus truthy. So thank you so much. Now have a a wonderful day. We appreciate your time so much. Thank you both. Thank you.